the research community about that. I think there's renewed interest in the role that dietary factors uh, may be playing in uh, MS. Uh, we've heard about the problems of uh, obesity perhaps playing a role in uh, uh, young teenagers uh, in increasing the risk of MS. Um, we believe that um, a low-fat diet is actually uh, has some benefit. It, it's a uh, there's data that suggests a low-fat diet is an anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, so uh, we've been doing uh, research looking in particular at a, a low-fat vegan diet uh, as, as an approach to, to uh, treating MS. So I think the, the bottom line is um, uh, one needs to eat a healthy diet, and, and we believe a low-fat diet is a, uh, a good way to go. Um, but a lot more research needs to be done in terms of uh, dietary interventions for MS. Yeah, I, I'd like to make a comment about this because you realize that we were treating MS for over 100 years with uh, what is now uh, alternative medicine. So my feeling is that we need to study the alternative medicine, but you need to be on something that has been proven. If you have relapsing remitting disease or if you have uh, progressive disease with relapses, which many of you have, uh, we did a study some years ago with about 80 secondary progressive patients, and the way you got into that study was not to have a relapse in two years. Well, once they were in the study and we were seeing them on a regular basis, it turned out that 50% of them were having relapses and didn't even realize it, but it was apparent to us when we would see them. Uh, so the alternative food, vitamins, motor oil on your forehead, any <laughs> sort of thing that is advertised has to be in addition to medications that have been proven by study. So, Les, I'm going to take you on about this. So, I, yeah, well, so we, for, we, first we off, just, just, just a second, just a second. <laughs> uh, first off, uh, I don't think I said a word about not taking uh, therapies. No, 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 no. And, and I think to uh, degrade uh, 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 lifestyle medicine by uh, comparing it to putting uh, motor oil on your forehead is a major mistake, okay? I think that uh, the appropriate use of uh, uh, disease-modifying therapies is appropriate, but to ignore lifestyle uh, medicine, to ignore the role of exercise, to ignore the role of uh, smoking, obesity, and a bad diet uh, is just as bad as not, as not prescribing medication. So, so let's, let's agree that... Uh, I, I, I agree with okay. that. Several questions about some someone of the new. Had, uh, we have someone with a quick question, I, I guess, on that. Thank you. I was, you know, as Dr. Waters, my doctor, and he knows that I, I, I just can't come in for anything in the hospital for the calcium spot. Um, I'm just curious, if you're talking about um, autoimmune illnesses and maybe Crohn's or maybe um, uh, the, the thing that you were talking about earlier that you found, the one, the one uh, component that you found in that one patient that the uh, cause of teeth. Do you think that there's uh, any kind of correlation between um, the gut, um, the diet, the you know, uh, motor oil? <laughs> So I'll weigh in since these two already <laughs> express their opinions. I, I do. I just don't think we're smart enough just to fully in. understand it. And so I, I, I advocate complementary approaches that are safe uh, and not too crazy or expensive. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, some of the original observations of, of Swank 40 years ago are sort of compelling. And if you, what's most compelling to me is that the risk of MS has tripled in women, young women, in certain countries over the last two or three decades. And when you look at why that is, it's associated with conversion to industrialized Western lifestyles, you know, high fat, smoking, uh, pollution, uh, stress, living indoors, wearing clothes all the time, <laughs> all, all these things. So, <laughs> so all, but in all seriousness, I, I do think that uh, we're, we may be ignoring some obvious clues that, um, that the prevalence of MS is going up because of our lifestyle. Yeah. Well, we need to, we need to, as um, Les said, we're studying the gut microbiome. Howard Weiner, who's part of our group, has some provocative data that one type of organism may be more prevalent in the gut uh, in MS patients, but uh, this can take several years to sort out. 
Okay, if we could just hold our questions because we have several to get through first and then we'll, we but, but remember them so we, you can ask them after. Emmanuel, you have a, quite a yes, pile so of questions here. Um, maybe, yeah. are we done with all the progressive MS questions? Yes? Okay, so we uh, can move on to the, uh, the second topic that was women in MS. And uh, we have a bunch of questions that are related to actually um, uh, interactions between some drugs and pregnancy. Uh, and uh, a couple of the questions are whether there are any medications or uh, whether MS itself has uh, an effect on fertility. And at this point, we really uh, have not seen any relationship between having MS and having difficulty being pregnant. Uh, and you know, by, uh, by that, uh, typically the, the rate of uh, children born from women who have MS is similar to the rate uh, in women who don't have MS. However, sometimes women who are diagnosed with MS sometimes elect to not have children because they're concerned about what the impact could be on their disease. Uh, for many years, for many decades, uh, you know, neurologists used to tell their patients a long time ago that they shouldn't be pregnant. Now we know that it's not true. It doesn't actually, there's no increase in progression of MS during pregnancy. Uh, there's a little rebound. Actually, pregnancy is a good time uh, considering the, the decrease of relapses during the pregnancy. And it's followed after uh, the delivery by a slight increase in the risk of having relapses, but it all balances out. So there's no issues uh, with being pregnant. The medications that are being used do not seem to uh, alter fertility either, although this is a topic that uh, is very difficult to address uh, from a scientific standpoint. So it's really hard to... Uh, um, come up with uh, studies that clarify that the answer to that question. What people do when they're studying that, they are studying first in animal models whether some drugs may uh, change the rate of fertility, and that's a first hint whether there is a signal there or not, although you can't translate what you see in the animal uh, directly to humans. Uh, so at this point, there's uh, mostly one drug that's FDA approved called mitoxantron that we don't use so much. That is a chemotherapy that uh, is probably decreasing fertility because it may uh, induce early menopause in women. Uh, if you use also for a long time uh, another chemotherapy that we have used for MS uh, more in the past than now called cytoxin, cyclophosphamide, it can also have an impact on fertility for both men and women. But except for this medication, there's really no known impact about the medications and their impact of being able to, uh, to have uh, children or not. I have more, but it's nice to alternate, I think. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so I have a question. How long does someone need to be off uh, medication, beta interferon in this case, to get pregnant during and after pregnancy? So basically the recommendation for beta interferon is to be off for two months prior to trying to conceive. So if you're using some sort of birth control, then um, stop the beta interferon, continue to use that, and then start to try to conceive. There are ways, um, because I, I mentioned, you know, you're always worried about could something happen in that interim period while you're trying, and some of the strategies that we've used um, is to give a dose of IV steroids when someone has a cycle, doesn't conceive that cycle, has their period basically, gets a dose of IV steroids and then tries the next time around to conceive. And then after pregnancy, um, it's safe to restart beta interferon as long as you're not breastfeeding. And that is a general recommendation. Um, there, right now, aside from IVIG, which is not a commonly used MS medication, none of the MS medications are approved for during the breastfeeding uh, period. There is some data suggesting that breastfeeding, especially if you do it exclusively, meaning no formula at all, might be protective during that period, but that, you know, having now recently been a mom of twins, that's very difficult to do, one. And um, two, um, some women may just, you know, even relapse through that. So there still are some concerns about uh, starting, uh, about the need to start treatment soon after uh, delivery. Yeah, let, let me uh, uh, make a point about this. Um, I have a whole bunch of the same questions here that you've already answered, but there is certainly uh, a pattern uh, that we look at 
in the postpartum period, and that is what was the patient's clinical course before they got pregnant? If they were having one or two relapses a year for a year or two uh, before they got pregnant, that's the patient we worry most about in terms of a rebound after the pregnancy. Because remember, uh, half that baby is not the mother, which I'm reminded of all the time. Uh, <laughs> the, the issues, though... The, the worst half, isn't it? It's the worst half, right. Uh, but the idea being is that uh, the mother is immunosuppressed. Otherwise, she would reject that fetus. And the bigger the fetus gets, uh, the more uh, the immune response of the mother has to be suppressed. So that's why in the third trimester, pregnant women do very well when they have MS. Uh, but the rebound is really, uh, in many instances, related to what the course was like beforehand. So Confero studied this and showed that if the patient had not had a relapse in a year or two, that the postpartum period was pretty benign. Uh, in terms of breastfeeding, although the data is not complete, uh, there is some suggestions that perhaps breastfeeding can be protective, uh, but clearly, uh, at least in my practice, I don't want any breastfeeding mother to be on any medication. Uh, I just think we don't know, and therefore I think it's wise that they're not on anything. Uh, and we do treat them with steroids and IVIG and things of that if they get into trouble. Uh, but uh, I don't discourage uh, breastfeeding in, in that way. Uh, the only other thing is that we don't know what the level is of any of these medicines in breast milk. Um, so the issue really should be, uh, let's wait until that data is available. Um, but I think the most important point is that not everyone who gets pregnant has a severe course postpartum that it's usually those people that are having trouble beforehand uh, that have the most difficulty. And those are people that we tell and let them make that decision uh, whether they should be breastfeeding or not because they had such a terrible course before they got pregnant. So my questions, um, we'll start off with, uh, there are several questions related to the symptom management, um, including uh, developing pain. Um, so. Pain does exist in multiple sclerosis. I know in the past in literature, uh, sometimes pain was actually excluded, but uh, pain can be of several types. Um, and pain can be as uh, things like tingling, which can be very uncomfortable. It can be uh, pain that's radiating and electrical. And, uh, and so, uh, so pain is something that definitely needs to be discussed with the physician. Uh, there was a question here about uh, the extremities uh, of an individual that uh, not only is painful, but is also changes in temperature uh, when, where the limbs can get cold uh, or just uh, discoloration. And sometimes these symptoms we see with MS, but also can be a side effect of certain medications. And so they need to really be discussed with, uh, with the physician to, um, you know, to make sure that we are uh, taking care of those symptoms. Uh, if this is an in individual with progressive MS, uh, even more importantly, because it's a symptom that we can try to alleviate and make their quality of life better. Uh, there is multiple medications that we use to treat pain. Uh, most of these medications are used in, uh, in other conditions. Sometimes they include antidepressants and also medications that we uh, sometimes call anti-epileptics uh, to control this type of neuropathic pain that the uh, MS individual may be suffering. Uh, the changes in coloration in the limbs uh, sometimes is because of the MS itself, meaning uh, if somebody has been in a wheelchair or is mostly sitting most of the time, the circulation gets affected. And so we do need to make sure that those limbs are being uh, covered and protected and, and made warm um, or, you know, massaging and increasing range of motion. And like Dr. Chitnis has uh, alluded to this in the um, uh, prior um, questions, was uh, physical therapy could be very important for this individual. Um, I have several questions that are tied in with Tecfidera, um, which I will 
Should I go ahead and answer those right now? So, um, the Tecfidera is our newest drug that's available for the treatment of multiple sclerosis, uh, also known as BG12. Uh, it came out at about April of 2013. It is uh, by Biogen. Biogen makes also Tysabri and Avonex. And it is uh, our third oral therapy that's available for treatment of relapse and remitting MS. It is a pill that is taken twice a day, so very different than the other two pre-existing oral therapies that are once a day. Uh, the mechanism is not fully understood, but it is thought to uh, go through a pathway called as uh, NRF2, uh, which is uh, sort of an antioxidant property, very strong. And, uh, and one of the major side effects, um, or side effects that can be seen with the, this medication includes flushing um, and also uh, some GI irritation, sort of uh, nausea or vomiting or diarrhea. Uh, these side effects, unfortunately, uh, we cannot tell who's going to get them, uh, but it is, uh, there was a question here that um, asked if they could actually be in a different type of diet before they start Tecfidera to prevent these. As of now, that I know, there is nothing that you can do, but you can try taking the medication with, uh, with food, um, and, uh, and then we, we check to see if you're having these type of symptoms. Unfortunately, um, in our clinical practice, we have observed about 10 to 15 percent that discontinue uh, due to these side effects. Uh, but it is a medication that's approved for uh, relapse and remitting forms of MS. Um, just a little bit about Abagio, which was another question. Uh, Abagio is the other oral therapy that came out October 2012. Uh, Abagio is made by uh, Genzyme. It is an oral therapy once a day, and, um, and it is derived from a uh, medication used for rheumatoid arthritis, known as leflunamide. Uh, there is its own side effects um, with it, uh, and, uh, and so really defining the uh, profile for each medication is complicated in just this conversation, but it is, we do need to take into account uh, what, you know, the potential side effects that that medication will have in relationship to your own uh, quality of life, but also uh, what pre-existing conditions you may have. Um, uh, bond.